I've lost count of the number of times I've complained about the fact over recent years that the conversation that we tend to be having on the big political shows on Sundays tend to be conversations between politicians who live in London and journalists who live in London, and they wonder why the rest of the country isn't watching. So, Lisa, you have written this really interesting new book. It's called All In, How to Build a Country That Works. It's basically kind of your blueprint for how we fix Britain. It's very timely. Um, tell my listeners what your ideas are. Why did you want to write the book and what are your big themes? Well, it was inspired by the months that we spent here in Wigan trying to save Wigan Athletic, my local football club, that was put into administration in the most bizarre circumstances. It had been taken over by a new owner only a few hours before. Uh, it was a healthy, well-functioning, brilliant football club, really well run, no significant debts, and then plunged straight into administration. Um, we think perhaps because somebody wanted to hide a gambling debt, but those rumours were never proven. What What I did learn, though, is that the thing that mattered most to us, our football club that stood in the centre of town for hundreds of years and been a huge part of our economy and people's identity, you know, you, the chair of our supporters club used to go to it with their dad um, as a child. You pass these things down as a sort of civic inheritance through generations. When we tried to save that club, we were at the mercy of big money interests. The systems that were set up to protect and defend us fell one by one. And the people who mattered the most, the fans, were treated as a nuisance, shut out of the rooms where decisions were being made. They came last when they should have come first and in the end we did save that club but we did it because of those brilliant brilliant people particularly our fans who put their hands in the pockets came up with not just funding but ideas and we worked together across the whole town with the support of the council and in the end managed to get a new owner avert mm. some pretty ropey owners and defend and save our club but we were lucky lots of other towns mm. haven't fared so well and what I came to see was that if we gave power and resources to people who have a stake in the outcome and skin in the game, they would build a country that works. But so often they're thwarted from doing so. The lack of those things, other people, the wrong people hold all the cards. And look, the, the story is fascinating and it's the kind of thing you could almost imagine a, a film being made about it because there are so many communities that, that do really feel and empathise with what your community went through. And part of it is this condition, it's almost like a, a sort of flog at Britain that we have had for a long time, whether it's football clubs, whether it's utilities. A lot of people do feel the sense of powerlessness, um, that we have a society where everything is flogged off. It's the sort of price of everything, but but the value of, of, of nothing. I'm sure many of our listeners will really be uh, agreeing with this, but how do you actually change that Lisa when you know whenever there's something up for, for sale it does feel like a lot of foreign money comes in local people feel very disconnected but how do you actually change that? So I, I think you're right I think there is a sense of um, us knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing and the great political upheavals that we've seen over recent years, whether it's been the rise in support for nationalism in Scotland, in England, in Wales, whether it's been the dramatic rise in support for UKIP that sort of bubbled to the surface in 2015, or the vote to leave the European Union. I think all of these things have been driven by people calling time on an economic model that isn't delivering for them and their families and a political system that has just failed to respond you've got to tilt the balance of power back in favour of people. And that means that the state has to stop doing everybody else's job, trying to micromanage millions of decisions that are none of its business. The most farcical recently was the a levelling up grant handed out to a northern town not far from here in Wigan for, for park benches. I mean, central government shouldn't be deciding whether we have park benches or not, but what it should be doing 
is its actual job. It should be clearing the pitch so that those people who are in it for the long haul, who want to build and create, can do so. Um, at the moment, what we've got is a situation where far too many people are allowed to come in and extract and take, whether it's the foreign owners taking over our football clubs or whether it's the landlords, the private landlords who've bought up large swathes of the housing stock across the country and are letting it out, claiming huge inflated housing benefit and letting those properties go to rack and ruin, destroying entire communities. This is our country. We own it and power ought to be put back into our hands. And when you say power should be put back into people's hands, just explain a bit more of, of, of what that means, because I think it means different things to different people. And I have heard some people make the argument when they hear politicians say, actually, we want to give more power to local people, they should make the decisions. I've heard people sometimes push back and say, well, hang on a minute, we're really busy getting on with our lives. We want good politicians, trusted politicians, competent politicians to get on and, and run the country and run local communities, but but do it well. We don't have the bandwidth to do that yeah oh I mean I make no apology for believing that decisions that are made um by by people together tend to be better decisions that's been my experience over the last 12 years as an elected politician and before that actually as a, a local councillor as well um there's a reason why the community energy schemes that were co-owned and run by hundreds of local people survived the end of the last Labour government while the sure starts that were conceived in and executed from Whitehall didn't last more than a few weeks before the government was able to pull the plug because when people have a stake in the outcome they they try harder they work more they do more they keep going for longer because they can do no other if I learned that anywhere it's been from mums who've been through my constituency surgery over the last 12 years with children with special educational needs and they've regardless of circumstances income educational background confidence they have mastered and beaten those opaque systems that surround their children's care because there's so much at stake so I genuinely believe that if we put proper power back into local hands, that we had mayors and councils across the country with proper powers over skills and housing and the the ability and the funding that they need to be able to make decisions about how to best drive local growth in their own areas using the assets and the potential that they have. If those councils and mayors became far more responsive to people, local people, and far more accountable to them, I think this country would be in a far better place. We're one of the mm. most centralised countries in the world, and it just hasn't served us well. And what's interesting about what you've just said is you've talked about kind of, you know, these amazing local heroes, really local heroes and local sheroes doing brilliant things in their community. But as you say, there does exist this architecture of local government, local councillors, these new mayors, which are really important addition to our local democracy. But there's been a lot of talk about how to do this. You know, governments of all hues have aspired to, to give more power out to, to local people. Michael Gove, of course, the opposite number, the levelling up uh, minister. We've heard this phrase, levelling up. And the Labour Party's been looking at this as well. Gordon Brown has been um, running a commission looking at greater devolution, which is going to be reporting on Monday. Full disclosure, I have been part of that um, commission. I mean, I mean, obviously you probably won't be able to disclose too much of, of, of what the work he's been doing, but what do you think Labour does need to be doing in terms of that agenda? Because as many of my listeners will be like, oh, well, listen, levelling up's like a trope now. We just, you know, everybody talks about levelling up, but what does what does devolution actually mean? And I know you've been working with Gordon Brown. Yeah, so there are some ideas that we have floated in the book, things like the minimum infrastructure guarantee that the economist Diane Coyle has proposed that no no place should be able to fall further and further behind. Every place should be guaranteed a basic level of infrastructure, whether that's decent housing, police services, um, educational access, um, or transport links, which obviously is critical to people across the country right now. The reason that Dan Coyle proposes that is because without those things, there's no base from which to build a thriving local economy. And the truth is that this country can't go on trying to power a major economy using only a handful of people in a handful of sectors in one small corner of the country. We've written off the assets and potential that exist in most parts of Britain. And by doing so, we've written off people 
for whom geography is increasingly destiny. And we've written them out of our national story as well. My town in Wigan is well known the world over because of our mining history. Nobody here wants to reopen the coal mines, but that sense of pride and purpose and the contribution that we made to the future of this country, that's something that we want back. And in every part of Britain, I've seen the same. So if we move power back into people's hands, you could see you could see what the future looks like. Kira and I went to Grimsby when he first appointed me to this job. Leveling you up. yourself in and recent days have been saying that you're losing about there. 100 the men that each day wind in the fighting Grimsby in the Eastern Donbass 20 region. years ago, the last Labour At government set up regional development agencies. The, circumstances the head of that agency lived in Yorkshire. You, Mr. President, you could see the potential to try in and So while everybody for some kind of was lamenting... Peace, what was if happening that's the, to the right fishing word, industry, with the Russians, he was investing to give up on some so of that, that territory the young people that you're trying to regain or hold Grimsby at the moment. Dogs. This is the yeah, sort of country that we could build if we had the right hands and if national governments set up to do what it's supposed to be doing, not what everybody else would be doing. I do remember the regional development yeah, agencies very well. In fact, the RDEs, they were very popular, actually. People really liked them and they were abolished. Like, I do remember, very nerdy, but yeah, they were they were actually very popular. That's how we all used to be and I were, were real nerds about these things. And listen, before we, we move on to other um, topics, in terms of you know, changing power and, and structures, one of the ideas that has been talked about is changing the, the House of Lords, maybe abolishing the House of Lords, setting up some second chamber with far more representation from the nations and regions. Would you support that? Yeah, I've long supported the reform of the House of Lords. It's difficult to appointed second house. And I was a big supporter of the last Labour government's um, decision to remove the hereditary um, element of the House of Lords as well. But I think there's a wider point here, which is that our regions and... Uh, you know, our towns, villages and cities are not well represented at the heart of national government. I've lost count of the number of times I've complained about the fact over recent years that the conversation that we tend to be having on the big political shows on Sundays tend to be conversations between politicians who live in London and journalists who live in London, and they wonder why the rest of the country isn't watching. We've we've got to start getting more voices into our politics. We've got to get decision-making to the right place. But fundamentally for me, we've got to reform the centre because this is not a book that argues that local is good and national is bad. If anything, the experience of trying to save Wigan Athletic showed me how much good, active, empowered national governments partnering with their communities and matching their level of ambition matter. It's just that we haven't had one for quite some considerable time. And right across the country, you can see the problems that have been caused by that, whether it's frequent flooding caused by climate change or older people being defrauded out of their savings or football clubs like Berry mm. going under. You, you can see the impact. Of and, 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 the, and the trains and, and transport and, and, and the right. trains. Right. So you can see the impact of national governments who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They should be tilting power back to people who have a stake in the future of this country. And they should be taking on the big interests with other like-minded governments across the world that are preventing that from happening and destroying so much of value. And I genuinely believe that if we did that, if, if we created that, if we had the government that we deserve, we could. this country could be the country that I've believed in all of my life, but never yet quite seen. It's not that people are angry. The anger comes from a place of hope because people know that things can and must be better. And I'm absolutely determined that before I leave politics, we'll have done that. Well, stay with us. We're speaking with the Shadow Secretary of State for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities, and the Labour MP for Wigan, Lisa Nandy. She's telling us all about her new book, All In, How to Build a Country That Works. We're going to be hearing more from Lisa just after this. Okay, that's the trail done. Um, welcome back to Weekend Drive this Saturday evening. I'm chatting with Lisa Nandy. She's the Shadow Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. She's the Labour MP for Wigan, and she's the author of a really interesting new book called All In, How to Build a Country That Works. 
Now, Lisa, one of the other things that's really interesting in your book is you talk about a lot of division in the country um, over Brexit. And, you know, you and I had some clashes back in the day over the situation on on, on Brexit. And it's been a, a real source of, of division in, in the country. But now the Labour Party under Keir Starmer is saying, look, the party's not going to reverse Brexit. We're not going to reverse freedom of movement. Keir Starmer made some quite quite challenging comments about immigration um, last week at the CBI conference. The country has to wean itself off immigration. Now, a lot of progressive people are quite upset with Labour and quite upset with Keir Starmer about this. All the evidence shows that Brexit hasn't been great for, for the country, for the communities that you represent, the communities that you want to, to do better. I mean, how do you think Labour navigates the issue of, of Brexit now? Because clearly a lot has gone wrong with Brexit and there will be some people listening to this who feel a bit betrayed by Keir Starmer and the leadership, including yourself. Well, I mean, I was one of the people who campaigned for Remain. I was I put in more hours as a member of the Labour Party front bench than any other member of the shadow cabinet, I think, apart from Hillary Benn during the Remain campaign. And I spent most of them in parts of the country, like mine in Wigan, in Bolton, in Sunderland, where people had consistently voted Labour for 100 years, but we found ourselves on different sides of the argument when it came to Brexit. And over the course of that time, I think I started to understand that there was something far more profound, something much deeper happening. It was when I was in Sunderland and we'd been asked to go and talk to the workforce because the management was supporting Remain, but a lot of the workers were supporting Leave. And I said, these jobs may well go. There's a real risk that good, well-paid jobs, skilled jobs in this region could leave if we if we leave the European Union. And a guy said to me, we know and we're going to do it anyway. And that was the point at which I stopped talking at people during the campaign and started really listening. And what I heard was people who were determined not to see further economic decline in their areas, who'd seen decades of it and had seen with those good jobs and the spending power go young people who had to get out to get on and high streets falling apart and um, all the things that mattered to them just not defended or responded to by a political system that said, well, this is what progress looks like. Now, he and I had completely different views about whether the European Union could help, was help, going to help or hinder that process. But when we left, I was in no doubt that if we were going to not har further harm that sense of loss of trust in our political system, we had to leave and we had to leave with a close relationship with the European Union. And that still remains my view that we've left now and there is no appetite across Europe to reopen those negotiations. It would be an incredibly divisive thing to do in this country. And this country's got to move forward. We've got to stop, stop fighting each other. We've got to stop fighting the battles of the past. And we've got to think about what we could be. We could do so much better with a much closer relationship with our closest friends and neighbours in Europe. And no. that's why we make no apology for saying that this is what we've got to focus on now, because there's so much at stake for Britain. But having said all that, the reality is it is going to be quite difficult to have a, a closer relationship with Europe because it's been a very difficult time. We're all having these discussions about the parlour state of the economy and how we need more growth. I mean, a lot of my listeners will be thinking, actually, a lot of the country has moved on Brexit. If you look at the opinion polls, a lot of people now regret the fact that we have, have left the, the EU. What do you say to people listening who are maybe soft Tory voters, soft Liberal Democrat voters who, who do want to consider voting for Labour? But for them, Europe is still important and it doesn't seem to make sense to them that the Labour Party is just closing off an avenue of discussion. Well, we're not closing off an avenue of discussion. I mean, the, the debate around Europe has been had long before we entered the European community and it will continue to be had. Um, and I think it was Keir who said during the leadership contest back in 2019, look, if future generations want to revisit our relationship with Europe, nobody is going to stop them. But the point is that we had a referendum. We said we would respect the results. And now we've got two choices. We could either reopen that conversation here in Britain. We could end up potentially applying to join, rejoin the European Union 
and be at the back of a queue uh, trying to negotiate entry again on far less favourable terms than we left. That's a process that I suspect would take years and years and I think will be very contentious in Britain. Or we could seek a closer relationship on trade, things like a veterinary agreement, which are urgent in Northern Ireland particularly, but for the rest of the UK as well. We could safeguard the Good Friday Agreement. We could um, move forwards with foreign and security cooperation. We've seen the damage that's done when we're not in the room having those discussions with our European partners when it comes to Putin and Ukraine, but also with COP26. I mean, I was shadow foreign secretary while we were hosting the world's most important climate summit. And John Kerry came over to visit um, European leaders to set the agenda for COP26. And the UK wasn't even represented at that meeting. I mean, that's just a nonsense. And we could sort that out very quickly with goodwill on both sides. So, Lisa, we've got a couple of minutes left. There's a few other things I want to um, ask you about. We've just had um, the result of Chesterfield. Labour did very well there. I mean, it does feel that things are looking very, very good for Labour. The opinion polls are, are very strong. But you and I both know from our time in the Labour Party, there's absolutely nothing that says that the Labour Party is destined to to win a general election. Lots of things can can still go wrong. But... But how does it feel as a shadow cabinet person to really feel that, like, for the first time in a long time, you could have a shot at power? Um, it feels um, it feels very different to what we're used to. I got elected in 2010. We just um, lost power. The coalition was being formed when I first set foot in Parliament. And we've been ahead in the polls before, but I think we're being treated very differently at this stage than than certainly over the last 12 years, that there's real scrutiny of our policies and proposals, real interest in our agenda. Rachel Reeves and I met with all of the big banks and mortgage lenders recently, and you know there's real engagement, I think, from sections of the country that previously we didn't have a huge dialogue with. So it, just on a day-to-day -day basis, it feels very different. But we are not remotely complacent about it. If you remember, Aisha, when, when Ed Miliband was leader, we were consistently about 10 or 15 points ahead in the polls for several years. Um, oh, yes, and I, I still remember the, the fond memories, Lisa, the very <laughs> Sorry, fond yeah. memories, well, just, slightly tr just having a triggered moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, fundamentally, I think Labour doesn't win by default. We've won 100, uh, in our 100-year history, we've won just three times. And those moments have always been when we've stepped forward with an ambition that matches the level of ambition that you find in every family and community in this country, whether it was the post-war moment in 1945, huge programme of council house building to end the squalor of, that had existed before the war, mm. whether it was the 60s and 70s when we rose to the moment and said to working class kids and immigrant families and single mm. uh, and mums going into the workforce, we're going to back you with comprehensive education and, um, and race Lisa, relations just... act and equal pay. The, you know, these are the moments that we we shape the, the future of the country and we're and... very aware that that's what we've got to do. And do you feel that you're in, the, in a position to do that? Because... Lots of people are fed up with the Conservative Party. You know, we hear this a lot from, you know, lifelong Conservative members. But do you think that they honestly feel that Labour has this programme for transformation? Because a lot of people, particularly in, in Tory heartlands, where Labour has to, to win seats back and you have to persuade Conservative voters to swap and come to the Labour Party, vote for you and, and Keir Starmer... What they have said in focus groups recently is, look, we're fed up with the Tories. We're very worried about, angry about the cost of living crisis, but we still don't really know what Labour stands for. They don't seem to have anything positive or distinct to offer. They're very, very good at criticising the Tories. But what is it that is different and new about Labour? What do you say to them? I, I say that's why I wrote this book, because a year ago, Keir asked me to move into the role as shadow levelling up secretary, because we know that we need to inspire people to believe that this country can fundamentally be different. I think they, they believe that, they just want a government that matches it. We're gonna move power 
back into people's hands so that every person in every part of Britain is able to make a contribution to the future of our country again. And by doing so, we're going to build a country that can defend its public services, that can invest in its young people and can look outwards to the world, be the light on the hill for people in times of darkness. That's the sort of country everybody in, in Britain knows we can be. But we need we need power in the right places. We need, we need every person respected and valued in order to make a contribution again. And final couple of questions for you, um, Lisa. Um, I mean, you're known as a fiercely proud Labour person, but it is interesting that you actually have quite a good relationship with your opposite number, Michael Gove, who is the Secretary of State for Leveling Up. And am I right in believing he actually came to your book launch? <laughs> he did. He did. He actually bought copies of the book and handed them out at Cabinet, apparently. I mean, it's never one to make friends easily, is he? So maybe some of your ideas might get nicked by the Conservative government. How do you feel about that? Oh, I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted. He, he asked me to write an inscription in his book and I, I wrote, Dear Michael, this is how you build a country that works. <laughs> so if he wants to take them, if anybody wants to take them, I am more than willing. In fact, there is a sort of serious point about this. I mean, I, I think Michael Gove was the single worst thing to ever happen to education in this country. But on this agenda about rebuilding Britain, if we can't build a cross-party consensus on this that outlives the last, like the next Labour government, then we won't be able to build that country. And so working across party lines, working with whoever you can find and whatever alliances you can build, that's the sort of politics that I've always practised and that's the sort of politics that's going to deliver for Britain. And the final, final question to you is we've just seen uh, Matt Hancock come third in the, the jungle. Could you see yourself ever going on any reality TV show, Lisa Nandy? Well, I mean, uh, definitely not. I'm a celebrity. I mean, I can't, I can't think of a single reality TV show I'd like to go on. I think there's quite enough reality in politics. <laughs> the, 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 the Parliament Channel has like quite a lot of like quite mad <laughs> yeah, right. uh, reality TV. Not even Strictly could sort of shimmy your stuff on Strictly. Oh God, no, I can't, I can't dance to save my life. Although I, I never stop trying as you well know. <laughs> Um, but no, I think Matt Hancock has made a complete plonker of himself, whether he came third or not. And I think that right now, what people want to see us doing is our actual day job. We start doing our job, they'll be able to do theirs. And that's uh, that's going to be my focus, not um, hanging out in a jungle, eating sheep's anuses or whatever he was doing. <laughs> The, the dignity, the dignity of the whole thing really is something else. Well, look, Lisa, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. The book is brilliant. It's really, really interesting. There's a lot of very interesting analysis about, you know, the condition of Britain and a lot of really big ideas. Uh, the book is called All In, How to Build a Country That Works. Thank you so much for talking to Times Radio. Oh, thank you.